Viewer discretion is advised. And I sat in the car valley, rang her up, talked to her for half an hour, and just the words that she said to me in that half an hour flipped the script for me, saved my life. Mandate. Welcome to Mandate, where we navigate fresh perspectives and nothing is off the table. Tonight's guest is an amazing, an amazing individual. He is a man with a, a plethora of, of wealth, a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of, of and just, a, a, just a lot of knowledge, knowledge, knowledge and a lot of wisdom. Uh, the man is, um, I guess you could say he's been well sought after in terms of um, speaking engagements. He's, he's an amazing inspirational speaker, motivational speaker. The man's been on TED Talks, the man's been on major platforms and also a, a lot of major panels as well. The man is also, he's also the inter international acclaimed barber, but also an artist who is the founder of My Father's Barber, which gives it away. Uh, the man is also the author of She Is Not Your Rehab and with his lovely wife, uh, established in 2019, uh, an anti-violence movement, also known as She Is Not Your Rehab. The man has an incredible story to share at the table. Please welcome with me the incredible, the remarkable Mateo, a.k.a. Matt Brown. Uh, I feel famous, eh, is now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that beautiful intro. Intro, also. Oh, man, also, was, hey, also it's been a long time coming, uh, Matt. Um, I guess the, the, uh, the brothers and I were like, oh man, we can, you know, since last year, we we're like, oh man, if we can get Matt Brown, it'd be awesome. And so also, it's, it is, it's an honour and a privilege to have you on board tonight in the, in the podcast and in the house, uh, but also just to start the ball rolling because you've done just just the stories I've heard, just your work uh, around our men and, and also with our young people as well, and also with, with, with women as well. Um, also, can you tell us in terms of the tin shed? The tin shed, where it all kind of kind of started for you, the tin shed barber. Please tell us how that, there's the significance of the tin shed and how that all kind of unwrapped for you and and, and kind of how your your journey started as as, as a barber. Uh, thanks, Oso. Uh, so I started my journey working in the space in the domestic violence space, sexual violence space, uh, suicide prevention, mental health space, in my little garden tin shed in a place in Christchurch which we call the Hood. Um, Aranui in the 03 and so in this space um, in the hood where I mean most of us boys you know we grow up touching cutting each other's hair touching you know the closest clippers whether it's the um, Remington clippers or the the house scissors um, <laughs> we grab whatever we can to touch to cut our hair and so um, knowing that um, cutting my brother's hairs at first and then cutting friends at school um, it just gradually went on to becoming something that I started in my little garden tin shed. And so opening up this space, I wanted to cut the boys in my neighborhood. I, I, I was a joiner at first, so I was making furniture um, straight out of high school and then, yeah, decided to pursue my career in barbering. Um, so I opened up a space uh, at home in the garden tin shed. And um, when I put the, the word out there that I was cutting here, um, the neighborhood came in for these $5 haircuts. Um, $5 haircuts obviously grew to $10 haircuts and, and it went up. Um, but it was in that space where I, I soon learnt from cutting men's hair when they trusted me with the outer appearance, um, the inside stories that they carried with them. And I soon learnt that we were more alike than we were different. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's the beginning of this kaupapa where this all started, this conversations of having courageous conversations with our, our men. And also, because obviously, there's, I, I guess we'll kind of touch base on that afterwards, um, Matt, in terms of your, your the household and your experiences with, with dad and so forth. But you're saying that in terms of the tin, uh, tin shed and, and the barbering and connecting with, with, with men. And so in terms of the connection with men, was that kind of like, you felt like this is the kind of pathway I'm going to choose in terms of these men come in, they talk to me, they trust me, and they come alive. So when was the light bulb moment like, you know, this is, I can resonate with this. I, there's, a, there's a connection there. Um, it was just, I think, being vulnerable with my own story. Uh, when I started opening up to the men who sat in the chair, they then in return opened up to me and, and showed their vulnerability. Um, so it was then I really, you know, doing doing a cool fade, doing a good haircut is, is, is super cool. The reward for that when you see these men's faces is, is always rewarding. But when these men would open up and share, you know, their darkest secrets or their, their darkest shame that they thought that was so unlovable, and I in return met them with empathy and compassion, um, and you see the light bulb, in their own face, just just come on, come on. Um, that was really the beginning of me wanting to pursue this, creating this safe space for men. Um, and it actually started with um, a young client of mine. I've shared this before publicly. A young 
Tane named Liam who came into my shed for a haircut. And this was about midnight. You know, so he courageously came into the hood for a haircut late at night. It was my last spot of the night. And, um, you know, he sat down uh, for his haircut, cut his hair. It was kind of small talk. And then, you know, I started talking about growing up around alcohol, alcohol abuse and, you know, witnessing my father be an alcoholic. Uh, and then he, in return, shared his experience of watching his dad struggle with alcohol. Um, and so we connected on that level and um, cut his hair, listen to him, share a bit of a story. And, um, you know, as every barber shop, you show your client the, you know, the finished product with a small mirror. And as I showed Liam his haircut with my mirror, um, the gummer looks up, you know, stares at himself and then just starts crying. And I remember feeling awkward, like, oh, what do I do here? You know, like, cause like, you know, we're such fixers as men. We like to fix things. Um, and I said, also, are you all right? And he said that, um, this haircut, he had planned for this haircut to be his last haircut. And I said, what do you mean? He said, this was the haircut for my funeral. And when he said that, then I just started crying, you know, because my dear also, my dear client was struggling silently, you know, was suffering silently. And um, I didn't know what to say, but all I did was I just grabbed him and hugged him and just cried with him. And as he walked away from my shed that night, he turned around and said, Thank you for seeing me tonight. Thank you for seeing me. And I knew he wasn't talking about fitting him in for a haircut. It was really seeing him, hearing his story, and accepting him. And so um, that was my moment, my my light, light bulb moment to, man, there's a lot of stuff that our men are carrying um, and are struggling silently and not talking and telling anyone about. Um, how can I become a safe space for these men to talk? And so it was more than just a haircut then. It became more than just a haircut. Bro, man. Sounds like a bit of a, like a kind of, I don't know, I don't know, Matt, it seems like kind of more of a, kind of like a vocation, you know, kind of like, yeah, sometimes like you just know, like, man, this is, maybe this is what I'm called to do in terms of um, not only just being a barber, but also an amazing artist, but in terms of how, uh, well-being and, and being able to to um, bring forth insight and also your own world and also the, the worlds of these other men, bring them together and have these courageous conversations. So also, man, man props to you, man. Thank you. Man, sir. props. Yeah. Oops, thanks for sharing your story. Um, you know, at the time that you you have this light bulb moment, um, did you have everything together? Like, have you gone through your own healing process at the time? And and because of that, did you know, okay, this is what I wanted um, these men to experience as well? Man, never. I've never had it all together. Um, I don't believe healing is a is a journey, not a destination. And so my healing has actually come from talking to these men vulnerably and sharing and hearing their stories. You know, it's because I grew up in such a, a violent filled home, you know, if I could describe my childhood in one word, I would use the word unsafe. You know, it was unsafe to have an opinion. It was unsafe to think. It was unsafe to speak. It was unsafe to be me, Matt Brown. And so because I knew what it was like to be unsafe, to feel unsafe, I knew that I wanted to create the opposite. So how did I become safe? I ask questions. How do I become the safe person? I ask questions. You know, I ask the men that sat in my chair. You know, how do you love your wife? Or you know, what does a dad mean? You know, what is a dad to you? What does being a prison father mean to you? Um, because I never knew what a prison father looked like, felt like, mm-hmm. um, and so it was from the chair, from the barber shop, really, where my healing journey has has been gifted to me. And, you know, some, man, you would have met all walks of life, like. That's the gift of the barbershop, yeah, you know, you get yeah. every walk of, yeah, of life, you yeah, know. Yeah. You get the game patches, you get the men in the suit <laughs> yeah, and the ties, yeah. to the men in the uniform. You get, every man needs a haircut um, or a shave, um, <laughs> yeah. if they're bald. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah, that's the, that's the gift of the barbershop. You meet every, every walk, walk of life. And I guess your, your gift or um, part of being a barber is, like, seen that person for them rather than what they're labeled as because mm. it's easy for like a lot of men always get labeled oh you're a hard nut or you're patchy or you're a gang member and and hearing your story and some of the work you've done it just really f- like what a lot of these men resonate with or feel like a sense of freedom is that they can come and sit with you and they're seen for them 
and you know not for who they are or what they have done and so i really commend you for the work you've done and changing um the game and the narrative in terms of like how we supposed to see each other and i heard it this morning that uh at the Talanoa, honestly, man, I was at the conference and um, I was just, you know, I was excited. He sat on our table, but he didn't know who I was. I was going, yeah, one of those was, looks like me, dresses like me. And, <laughs> and then, you know, no one paid attention. Then he walked up and did his thing. And then everyone was like, man, I thought it was amazing. It was just, yeah, I was blown away. We could talk about that later, but sure. yeah. I just, <laughs> nice. Sorry, I talked nice, too much. Uh, my Lord, lover, Jesus, I mean. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, you mm. mentioned the word unsafe, um, you know, describing your childhood. And um, sometimes when, you know, we only know what we know and sometimes we accept things as normal because that's all we've ever been exposed to. Um, and just hearing you talk about the unsafety of childhood, did you sort of have an inkling growing up that things went right or did this feel normal to you and it wasn't until later that you were able to reflect back and think, Actually, that wasn't right, the way you kind of grew up. It felt normal, but then it also felt wrong. It felt normal when I was in my house, but when I was at school, because, you know, growing up in, in Christchurch and Otto the further south you go down in this country, the more whiter it is, you know, the, the more people don't look like you, talk like you, or, you know, act like you. And so when I was at school and listening to my, you know, my peers talk about their fun-filled homes and, you know, mum mom and dad taking them out to, you know, to rugby games, like I never experienced that, you know, I never, the one time that we had tickets to go and watch the Crusaders, you know, my parents got into a fight in the car, so my dad rips up the tickets and throws it out the window and then we're back home, you know, so when I say unsafe, to, to, to every degree what that word def means was my childhood. Um, I knew it wasn't normal because my friends at school did not live in this kind of home. Um, I knew it wasn't normal because when we would laugh about how psycho and crazy our dad was and the abuse that we endured, my friends wouldn't laugh. You know, when we would joke about it. You know, and you're sitting standing with your friends at school and laugh, and you know, it becomes the trauma Olympics who's had the worst hiding, and we just giggle and laugh. You know, to us that's normal, but to our friends, like that's not normal. That's abuse. Mm -hmm. Like, is it? You know, but so I did, and I didn't. It's interesting, eh, Matt, because I'm, I'm reading your book, um, She's Not Your Rehab, I remember in your book you're saying that um, one time you and your siblings were watching Once Were Warriors, you're watching it and you're just, you're just laughing, when Beth, obviously that part when Beth's getting hiding from Jake, and you're, oh, and you guys are all laughing, like, oh, this is, this is a comedy, this yeah. is a, obviously during, during a, a serious party, you think this is a comedy, and you think to yourself, man, mom gets worse hiding than this, and this is, this is funny. And so, well, tell us about that, because obviously in the household, in terms of um, dad and mom and, and, and the violence that you witnessed in terms of how do you shift from like this is like what, what Jay was saying is this unsafe is, is this normal is this normal is this was is, is, is this abnormal when I get out, outside the four walls of the, of this building and and I have to shift to like kind of was it like kind of like a oh, I have to hide this I have to be someone else when I'm out, mm -hmm. out in public so yeah I mean when when that movie came out Once We Warriors I was 10 years old we sat on the fella and we cracked up through the entire film yeah we could be we will compare beth hickey's black eyes to mum's black eyes mum's black eyes are way bigger than beth's because she will go to church like this you know bruised face with her big sunglasses hiding her black eyes but no one said or did anything people knew the violence people heard the violence people seen the violence but no one ever spoke up so for me you know growing up in christchurch there weren't many people that looked like us you know when we think of our superheroes for most of us brown kids growing up in new zealand in the 80s and 90s, our superheroes are the All Blacks, you know. So I grew up in the era of Michael Jones and Ronnie Clark, John Olomu. Those were our superheroes. Unfortunately for me, my country club was KFC and so I never went down the path of rugby. But so for me, hip hop was my saving grace, you know, to, to witness, um, you know, brown, black brothers and sisters across the other side of the world tell their stories of pain and trauma through music, through rhyming. That resonated with me. And so that was a pocket of, of hope. Of, of of dreaming um, than what I received at home. And so I held on to those little pockets of hope, um, watching what hip hop did and how it, you know, was a, a instrument for a lot of these kids who were in the projects, the the hood, to express themselves. And so yeah, from then on I I, I kind of knew that this is not the life that I want. 
I want to have been be different and and have a different life than what I've I've witnessed and been subjected to. So it's been a journey, you know. It hasn't mm-hmm. been easy. When people talk about healing, and it's it's often quite a um, loaded word these days, you know. Um, we think of getaways and um, I don't know butterflies and Sp- rainbows, spiritualism, yeah, yeah all that stuff. Yeah, but for me, healing was freaking on my knees crying, you know, shadow boxing the air because I'm so angry that this was what I experienced, that my childhood was robbed from me, that my innocence was robbed from me and it wasn't my fault, you know. And so it's been my life's work to talk about stuff that are very uncomfortable for our people um, because it's still happening in our backyard. Our kids are still suffering silently at the hands of unregulated adults who are choosing not to heal. So um, my greatest invitation, what I always tell people is, yes, your childhood trauma wasn't your fault, but your healing is your responsibility. Because what you do not transform, you will transmit. And it's really interesting, um, cool to hear the acknowledgement of anger and um, seeing the hopes. I really liked um, that bit about pockets of hope. And sometimes I feel like pockets, seeing pockets of hope can almost, almost be a double-edged sword on the one hand it's cool to see other people tell their stories live their truth but the flip side of that is it sort of helps illuminate that life has been hard and unfair um and so you know you talked a little bit about the anger and how did you avoid the anger building into resentment and hatred and wanting revenge and justice like sort of a crooked justice in terms of like wanting things to be evened out even though you can't go back in time and change things how do you overcome that because that seems like such a big hurdle in terms of trying to even start the journey of healing Mm, thank you um i spoke about it today for me my greatest invitation was my children um when i had my son when this thing came out of his mom and all he did was (laughs) shit and cry but it was love at first sight you know i fell in love with this thing and i thought to myself well how could anyone I want to hurt something so precious, such so, such innocence. Um, so he was my greatest invitation. I knew then that um, all this anger and bitterness and resentment that I carried inside towards the people who perpetrated violence towards me, um, my first perpetrators, my uncles, my aunties, if I had any chance of, of becoming the father that I've always wanted, if I had any chance of becoming the husband that I wish I witnessed, I would have to forgive. And so forgiveness for me looked like letting go, letting go of that, that, um, the, the pain of wanting someone to, to suffer for what they did to me, the anger of wanting someone to pay for what they did to me. Um, I had to let that go because if I didn't heal from from that, that anger would stay there and that would turn into something else, which would eventually transmit onto my wife and my children. And so if I wanted to be this dad, I had to let go. And so it doesn't condone the abuse mm-hmm. of what people have done to me, but it releases me to be the father for my children that I've always wanted. How, yeah, how, does, that, yeah, how does that happen, um, Matt? That yeah, looks like therapy. What does it look like? What does it look like? Um, like you, uh, yeah, because I've read the book and like, I know you, you talk about forgiveness and, and I'm glad that Jay brought it up. And I remember you saying that, that forgiveness, is, you don't want it to be like a tokenism ritual and you're like, you, just, you just said that, that people condone bad behaviour and just cover it up. But, but how do you get to that place? Because I, I, I can imagine, I can't, I, can't, I can't even imagine, Matt, going through some of the things that you've, you've experienced firsthand and, and like you get to a place, and, and, and yeah, we always say, it, some of us go to church and we go, oh, forgive, forgive and forget and love. But how do you actually come to that place where you're like, you know what, I'm going to really let it go, Matt, because... I just, I don't know, I don't know, maybe you're a better man than me, but I'll be just so hard to like, I don't know how to do this. Um, so for me, forgiveness is not a one, one, one thing, one event, one time event. Forgiveness, some days are easier than others, some days are freaking hard. Um, but I choose to forgive because if I hold, like the, who, the people who have perpetrated violence towards me, towards my mom, towards my siblings, like, I don't know what they're doing. For all I know, they're sleeping peacefully but I'm the one that's going to sleep resentful with anger, hatred. And so I had to forgive and let go. You know, I'm letting go of this for my sake, not for your sake. And that takes practice and it's freaking hard work. Um, But that's also a lot of therapy. 
You know, I'm a massive advocate for talking to people, finding your people who are about the work, who do the work, who care for you and talk to them about it. Because people people want to help. And that's mm. the, I think, something that people really don't believe. People, you know, for, Especially us men, we really believe people don't care and don't want to help. People do want to help. People do want to care and, and, and offer, you know, services and help. We just need to, you know, I mean, it's cliche, speak up. But my question is, if we speak up, are you safe? Mm. Mm. So it's called this narrative that's going around, brothers reach out, speak up. I think men know that. But if we speak up, what are we going to be met with? Mm. Are we going to be met with shame, with mocking, laughter? Or are we going to be met mm. with empathy, compassion, love? So it has to be a, a, a space that's, a safe space that's created and that men can trust. Um so that's also moose and like what what does therapy look like because you because when we think <clears throat> therapy we straight away we think cl clinical professional help man yeah um it can yeah. be i think but therapy can be many things um for some people it'd be, it'd be going to the gym um i i'm a massive woman do this better than men women catch up with their friends mm. You know, therapy for them is getting together, you know, and just talking and complaining about their husbands, their partners. <laughs> Us men, we don't do that, you know. And, and, and research shows for a lot of men when they reach their 40s and 50s, lonely, loneliness plays a massive part with men. We, we don't go out and hang out with our friends. And if we do, we have to have a beer or something in front of us. Like maybe just going for a walk or going with your boy to the gym or anything with your, your bro that doesn't require substance or alcohol um, is therapy. Mm. You know, just talking to your brother... Um, and for me, a lot of my therapy has been the clients in my chair, my work, talking to men, you know, asking those questions, you know, what did you do different? You know, what was your childhood like? What was your dad like? And what kind of father are you now? Mm. And, um, you have taken professional help in terms of, yeah, yes. Definitely. What's that been like? Because there's a <clears> lot of, you know, um, you know, our people don't trust that. <laughs> like if it's a white person on the other side, it's like, ah. Well, they are going to tell me they didn't, haven't lived my experience, but I think you're an advocate for that. And like, can you speak on that? I think it's important to find the right therapist. Not every therapist is going to be for you, mm. um, especially if they don't have your lived experience or look like you or talk like you. Um, so for me, I've had a handful of therapists over the years. Um, some, <coughs> some I've dismissed because they just don't get my cultural background and others I've fully embraced because they get it. Um, oh, you're, you're, you're going to be my guy. Um, and then once I'm done with, you know, with him or with her, I've you know, gone to a different person. When, when my mum passed away from cancer two years ago, I went into this massive pit of grief. Um, and it was hard. You know, I, I, I was struggling. I was crying every night for the first year I lost mum. Because what her death brought was the reality of the powerlessness I felt as a kid. You know, I was powerless. The powerlessness, I was so powerless in helping her and rescuing her from the abuse that she was, she was subjected to. And now struck with cancer, I'm still powerless and can't help her, you know. And so when that came to the surface, I was in the pits. I was struggling. I, I didn't want to talk about this work. I would just write and post up on social media how I felt. And so it was bad. It was really bad. And, and my wife knew that I was crying every night. And she said, my wife is, I married a very strong manawahine. Um, from Te Rarawa and Ngāpuhi, who said, if you struggle with this and you're someone who's emotionally aware, how much more other are other men out there struggling with grief and have never talked about it? So you better find something or do something to get out of this, um, but we need you. And I was like, okay. And so I rang a, a lady up here who's been a, a dear friend of ours who married us, Kathy Jones, um, who's Michael Jones's sister? I rang her because she had experienced. I had never met anyone who'd experienced more grief than her. You know, she lost her husband to cancer. She lost her mum. Um, she lost her dad. Uh, and so, talking to her for half an hour, I dropped my son off to his rugby rugby game training, rug, rugby practice, and I sat in the car valley, rang her up, talked for her, talked to her for half an hour, and just the words that she said to me in that half an hour flipped the script for me, like saved my life. Change, change, change the way I viewed grief. And so I seen grief as an invitation that I have loved um, and that I'll, I will always love my mum because her not being here now shows that I, you know, me and her connection was very real, that we really loved each other. 
So I will always look at grief as um, a gift that I have loved. Just mm. powerful. Let's mm. see it. Um, sorry. And in terms of therapy again, it was because you turned to it when you were at your lowest when mom passed away. But you also explained, um, you know, she's not your rehab style of it, like the idea that your wife, she's not your rehab, and you're going when you met her, she was like. You better get your crap together <laughs> before with this, you know, before we connect. So, are you able to explain yeah, that? So we were. Um, so the thing with my, my wife, she was my best friend. You know, I actually got into the industry because because of my wife. You You're know, following we were, her. <laughs> <laughs> so we were just friends. She worked with the teacher. The teacher. This is what I mean. You know how many of my clients would mock me? And say, I'm sure you guys are. I think that's like we we genuinely weren't. Yeah. So we were friends for four years. She worked for a non-profit organisation um, fighting human trafficking. So I've I've always admired her work. You know, she's a strong woman, wow. and she's for her. She's so passionate about um, injustice. And so I reached out to her and said, look, I'm thinking of leaving my trade job to become a barber. And she goes, oh, well, my dad's, um, you know, my dad runs a, a hairdressing academy called Seville's. Um, he started Seville's Academy, which is, you know, New Zealand's number one academy at the time. And I said, hey, I didn't even know that. And, she said, and he said, if you're serious about barbering, move up to Auckland and you can learn under my barber. So I said, okay, sweet. So I came up to Tamaki um, and he had a barber shop just off Queen Street. Um, and I went and uh, went into this barber shop. You know, it was becoming this Turkish guy. This guy was a third generation Turkish barber, so he was very fresh. Couldn't speak proper English. Beautiful guy. And I put my hand out to shake his hand. I was like, "Oh, it's Alofa Lava. My name's Matt." And he looked at my hand. And he goes, "All you young barbers are full of shit." And I was like, "This guy." Like, <laughs> but I heard he was tenth tenth down black belt. So I was like, "Okay, <laughs> I'll just like take that one for the team." Um, and so, you know, I looked like this, I had my, I had my dreads there and, and he said, grab the broom, that's your job. I was like, okay. So I just sweep the floor, sweep the floor. And the men that were coming through this barber shop were high end, you know, businessmen. Like I never seen one person wear casual clothes. It was all suit and tie. And so these haircuts were, you know, I'm used to these $5, $10 haircuts. These haircuts were nothing like that. The thing I loved about this barber shop was the way, even though he, his English wasn't the best, it was the experience these men received from him you know these white men who were sharing their stories and heartfelt pain with this turkish barber that was very moving for me and so i knew the kind of barber i wanted to be when i came back to christchurch and so sarah was living in uh, rarotong at the time and so we'd obviously you know conversed over the phone for the year that she was living in on the cook islands and she said oh i'm coming back to new zealand and i said well you know the barber shop's taking off my barber shit's taking off i could really use your hand your help and so she said i'll give you a year I said, okay. So she moved to Christchurch, um, came with her daughter, Oceana. Oceana would have been eight at the time. Um, yeah, eight at the time. So they moved down to Otetahi, and I was grateful, you know, she she gave me a shot. And so by the end of that year, she she reminded me, you know, I'm moving back up to Auckland to be with my family. And I said, um, do you want to be my girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> so it really was a, it was a, a business investment. Nah, <laughs> <laughs> we, nah, we, we, no, we. <laughs> I always joke about that. Um, but yeah, now nah, she, she worked for a non-profit organization, um, which we, we, we became friends. Um, she did a tour and she toured me around and I was speaking for her at these events. Um, and so that's where we became friends. But when, after her moved to Christchurch and gave me a year of the business, I asked her to be my girlfriend. And um, because she knew everything about me, she knew all the, the closet stuff, the darkness stuff that I thought was unlovable. This woman loved me. And I thought, I couldn't see my life without you. I can't see my life without you. So I have to ask this question. And it was awkward because we'd been friends for so long mm -hmm. and we'd never crossed that line. For me, out of respect to her daughter, Oceana, you know, I wanted to be a man who had integrity, who didn't, you know, walk all over her mum's heart and even her heart. I wanted to treat carefully. And so when I asked her, her response was, I love you, but you need to check your ass into therapy. And I did. I said, you know, and I swear to God, that poor therapist, he probably needed therapy after our session. But I just vomited everything because I really wanted to to be the best man for Oceana, our oldest girl. And so Jeez. it's been, yeah, 10 years we've been together, um, oh. eight years married. So I don't know, awesome. man. Yeah, so, the, so the feelings, <laughs> the feelings were mutual. Um, also. So yes, she, 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 she thinks that it wasn't, but it was definitely, it was definitely mutual. Yeah. Well, and I heard story. the... Um, I heard that you proposed the Nakaroa and that you actually spoke Aye. to Oceana first 
before you proposed to well, someone's done the research uh, to <laughs> um, and uh, I've heard mention that you know a defining vulnerable moment was you sharing with Sarah um, and so obviously I can tell that she's so special to you and that she means the world to you when was because I imagine when you're carrying this much trauma there's always a bit of negative self-talk always sort of trying to get at you about like oh this isn't right maybe you need to wait but was there a moment when you knew you wanted this woman in your life forever that you were going to pop the question I knew for the whole year. So before she moved, bef when she moved to the Cook Islands, I knew I loved this woman. Um, but I was so insecure. I was so damaged. You know, I just, I didn't think anyone could love me. You know, and so that's why we we did this hard, the hard yards of four years of just pure friendship. We talked about everything. You know, I would talk to her on the phone till I would go to work the next morning. You know, I'll be at my tra trade job, just, you know, so tired, but I just loved talking to this woman. Um, so I knew I loved her before I even asked her, um, and I just I couldn't see my life without her. And I, honestly, I would not be here if not for mm -hmm. for this woman. You know, she really she taught me what a safe space looked like. She taught me what a safe space felt like. She became home, and so she's a woman who refuses to be my rehab. Mm -hmm. um, the word I use for her is she's home, and so if she's my home, then I have to make sure my home is a safe place for her and for my children. Oh. But I absolutely, I love and adore my wife. Mm. So. And I, I always miss her when I'm not with her, you know? Oh so. man, that's awesome. Love it. Um, you know, some, man, what you've been through can be so heavy and there's probably times you're often, I don't know, you're probably relapsed or whatever, but then also this work that you're doing, you're, you're forever having to um, share the story, bring it up, go back to some of the emotions, and and this line of work's not easy. And man, how do you look after yourself also in terms of like carrying that weight? Because when you're down, you know that you can't stay down for long because man, I, I have a mandate, like I have a purpose. If I'm down, then someone, because people are watching me. How do you navigate through all that burden and heaviness? And um, I've learned a thing called boundaries. Yeah. Um, I've learned that through my wife. I've learned that through people I've researched and studied over the years. So boundaries are important. I, I came across the saying by Dr. Brene Brown, who, who's a Texas Balangi woman on the other side of the world. I call her my white mama because we share the last name. But her, her saying was um, boundary people are the most loving and I didn't understand that concept because growing up in my household boundaries was not a thing you know mm -hmm. anyone was a welcome in our house which also included you know abusers you know because we had our open home policy mom had a big heart mom and dad had big hearts to help whoever needed help but that you know opened us up to abuse and violence from different people and so I've learned a thing called boundaries I'm very boundaried now with my work um, when I go and do this work, I'm 100% focused on the work. I'm going to give 100% to this work. Um, to any man who is in front of me or sitting in my chair or I'm working with, I will give them 100% be present. After we're done, I'm at home with my kids and they get 100% with me. Because um, it's not fair for them, for me to bring my work home. You know, And so I've also learned, you know, our mama, our pain, our shame that we carry, that's ours to carry. So your pain and shame is not mine to carry, it's yours to carry. Mm. So when I talk and do this work with men, it's having the ability to show people, you know, their pain, this is yours to carry, not mine, and I'm here to accompany you and sit with you in it, but this is not me, mine to carry. You know, we lay this on the fella and it stays on the fella. We lay this on the barber chair and it stays on the barber chair. When I go home and open that door, my, my job is now with my wife and my kids. So that, very boundary. I have an amazing support network. I've got awesome supervisors, therapists, awesome friends that I trust with my life. Um, but this is this has been years and years of yeah. having these hard conversations, you know, uncomfortable mm. conversations yeah. with men, but when you have these hard conversations, courageous conversations, you build such beautiful connections. Cool. So what do you do for self-care also? Self-care, I have a cold shower every morning. Mm. Um, that, that kind of gets the blood flowing, gives me a good boost. Um, I am now going to the gym. <laughs> I'm eating well. Um, 
I do a lot of therapy, different 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 forms of therapy, um, and I just spend time with my kids. What really fills my cup is spending time with my kids. Mm. You know, I'm a real introvert, so because this work demands a lot yeah. of, you know, social work. You know, talking with people and sharing myself. Whenever I'm with my kids, they fill my cup. Just seeing them live such an opposite life to what I live, you know, they will never experience what mum and dad experienced. So just seeing them play peacefully and not having to worry or look over their shoulder or worry, feeling anxious if they're going to eat tonight or, you know, is dad going to be angry tonight or, you know, we have to start tippy-toeing. They will never experience that. So that is, is feeling life-giving for me. That's awesome. <laughs> I want to uh, talk about some of your uh, when you were in the barber business because I think even before I um, you would have popped off on social media I remember going down to Christchurch and the boys would go oh this is the barber shop and I think back here haircuts would have been about $15 at the local at the time but down there it was like 30 bucks. So, ah, I can't afford that but then they talked about the um, the shop and how pop like were you trailblazing at the time and what made you like know your worth in terms of like um yeah what made you know your worth and your value during a time where everyone was doing cheap cuts and it was just the demand like starting in my little garden tin shed you know i was working from 6 a.m to midnight mm. every night every night six days a week apart from sunday because mom would tell me off <laughs> um so i was working 6 a.m to midnight and then i got sick I got sick because I was just run down, tired, as well as cutting hair, my mental health, like just, you know, I was the first year of cutting hair, I didn't understand boundaries, you know, I just, anyone wanted a haircut, sweet. It's like, bro, can you fit me at five o'clock in the morning before I start work on the roads? I'm like, yeah, sweet, bro, come, you know, because I was at home, I was like, I'll just get up, get out of bed and go start cutting hair. Um, but then as I was like, this is not worth it, like, you know, I'm not making that much money just giving doing these five ten dollar haircuts and so putting these prices up came at a cost, you know. Because again, I don't want to lose my community, you know. These a lot of these single moms who are bringing in their kids, you know. I still wanted to cut them, so I had to juggle who was I gonna, you know, where was I gonna give my charity and where was I gonna make buck. And so, you know, knowing the difference, okay, this is where I wanted to give my charity. I'm not gonna do shave for a cure every bloody week, you know because cancer is mm. prevalent everywhere, but I can't afford to do that. Um, so I just chose the charities that I wanted to help and support. And so um, I've been very clear from that, from the beginning. Uh, Women's Refuge is, is my, my charity that I, I will always support and give my time free of charge for because they saved our lives. You know, If not for Women's Refuge and that kaupapa, I don't think I'll be here. Um, Mom wouldn't have been here. Um, but yeah, knowing my worth came at a cost. You know, and and you soon learnt when you the prices went up to twenty dollars. You know, you see, you our people start judging. It's like, oh, this guy changes, guy. You see that you'll never change your price. It's like, bro, but the price of milk has gone up. You know, price of eggs. The price, everything's <laughs> gone up. So you still speak me to what? Yeah. End up with nothing while you get your haircut. Um. So yeah, again, then you get a lease. You know, we we got a barber shop on the busiest street in the South Island, Rickerton Road. That lease was expensive. Um. I was nervous there, I was like, how am I gonna cover this? So we had to teach other barbers and the prices had to go up. And again, you still get pushed back, you know. Like, That's too expensive, you know, $45, $50 for a haircut. I was like, yeah, but I've got a lease to pay and I've got staff to pay, you know, feeding their families, like, so, yeah, it was successful. Um, mm -hmm. Nonetheless, but there was always pushback. Um, but teaching barbers has been a joy because, you know, as my prices went up, you know, I had apprentices whose prices stayed low, you know, so, you. You know, still come support this co-papa because this business supports our community. So you know, I have young barbers. Please get behind them and support them. And people, when they when they hear that, you know, they're like, oh yes, we will we'll still support you. You're not a cool. full on change this guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. And like you've you've recently um, hung up the tools, uh, but you've made a massive impact not only locally but um, nationally. Like even. Internationally, internationally, yeah, yeah man. And there's, you know, there's there's guys in the hood that we get cuts from, and they've been part of the wangana, um, some of the retreats that you've um, facilitated, and you know they are got dreams and and hopes as well, and they're more than just a barber. Like their 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 space that they've created um, has had a has been a product of some the ripple effect that you've been able to invest into um, the work that you've done. So, 
yeah, I just thank you. It's just mm-hmm. awesome just being able to sit in front of you also and just have this conversation. But yeah, I'm not trying to wrap it up. I just, <laughs> every now and then, I just love to honor, honor our guests. Yeah. Yeah, thank no, you so much. Awesome, Charles. Because that was about 10 years. It was just over a decade. Yeah, just yeah. over a decade ago. And that's awesome. Um, you know, aside from some of the nuggets, the golden nuggets you've already shared, um, I'm a big believer in that everything that comes before prepares us for what's ahead. Um, what are some of the sort of lesser known takeaways that you'll take from that experience 10 years um, in, in the barber shop um, that'll help prepare you for what comes next? Um, what are the takeaways? Yeah, some of the, the key takeaways that stand out to you. There may be lesser known, maybe some takeaways that only you would know upon reflecting on your experience. <clears throat> Um, good question. Father, you've been asked this question. Um, the key takeaways is everyone is important. Mm. Every person is important because you never know who that person may grow and in, grow into becoming. Um, when I started cutting hair, a lot of barbers, a lot of hairdressers refused to cut children refuse to cut children because you know they wouldn't stay still always <laughs> moving but for me that was an invitation for me to get better with my craft like that was teaching me patience you know and you i had kids who spat at me you know who like screamed and yelled um but Do I, you thought, ever oh. <laughs> I wanted to, to be, i wanted to yeah, this, this way you could hold your pressure, pressure the neck the neck well, i was just like um mom dad can you come in and eat those kids for oh. just like yeah um, I've wanted to, but it's taught me patience, um, and also given you know, taught me a steady hand when I come to, to do my artwork. Um, but you know what? These kids grow up to becoming men, you know. And so, since the shop is closed, you know, we ran that business for twelve years. Since that shop closed, there's so many things I've forgotten that I've done. But when every every time a, ch- a kid, a child sat in my chair, I always thought, I'm going to treat you how I wish that I was treated. And I'm going to try and see you, serve you, and give you the best freaking haircut ever. These kids have written to me since closing of our shop. Hundreds, I've received hundreds of messages that I, I haven't posted up. On. I've posted up a few on socials, but these hundreds that I haven't posted up. Um, where these haircuts have saved their lives. Where these haircuts coming into our barber shop and sitting with my barbers have literally saved their lives. But you never know, because I always try and teach my staff treat every person like this is their last haircut with you you know cut every person's hair as if you're cutting Arthur's hair as if you're cutting you know the king the king of kings your dad your granddad who's no longer here cut that person's hair as if you're cutting their hair for the last time that rolls through in how you serve them right how you see them how you connect with them and so you never know you know and then having these messages of us since we've closed it it's been an honour Likewise, it's, it's an honour, honour just you listening to you and, and sharing your, just some of the snippets of, of your life, but also just some of the struggles as well, Matt. And so I'm just curious, Matt, because um, I think of, of of the courageous conversations that you, you talk about and some of the, the men who are quite vulnerable and kind of sharing their stories and so forth. Has there been, has there been a time where you felt like, where people, have, you talk about setbacks, where people are like, you know, no, 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 I can't be vulnerable. I can't share this. This is just, just for myself. I just have to, I don't feel safe. Is it, how do you, how do you combat that in terms of people like, nah, what Matt's doing is, is not working. That's dangerous, unsafe. <clears throat> but I've been there because I've seen it for myself. I've seen it with my own eyes. Uh, obviously, Fitz, Fitz is here, 275. And so Fitz had a, had a, had a workshop at Barberhood and you were there. And some people I think, oh, what's it about? It's unsafe. But and people may have their own perception. But what I, whilst I was there, also, man, it really break down those walls. Those walls. Men were crying. Men were sharing their hearts out. And so, what do you say? What do you say to these those those naysayers? You go, oh, we've seen it before. It doesn't work. What 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 what, what, do, you, what do you say to those people who have never been in in that kind of um, presence or in that kind of arena? That's exactly it. They've never been in that arena. 
And so until you come and experience, like you're only speaking, people speak on stuff that they don't know or haven't have experienced. So don't come and speak to me on my lived experience because I know my lived experience better than anyone knows my lived experience. And so I know what unsafe feels like. I've worked my ass off to know what safety feels like. Safety does not feel like being ridiculed, being humiliated. Like, why would I ever want anyone to feel that when they're with me? And so that's the the, the space we try and really create. Um, you're not going to see that in a 15-second snippet on social media. You have to come and experience what safety looks like and feels like. Um, and that's fine. People can say what they want to say, the naysayers, that it's unsafe. It would be unsafe because they've never gone there themselves, you know. But the thing is, the mama that we carry has always been there. You know, the pain that we've carried has always been there. So we have to believe better for people that people are resilient. They can, you know, sit in the discomfort of their feelings and come at the other end. You know, feelings are just a tunnel, you know, they're just a tunnel. We're just going through this tunnel. There is light at the other end of this tunnel. Mm. So when you teach people that, you know, that it's all right to feel um, and you are not your feelings, you are more than just your feelings, you know, the, the light comes on. Okay, like I can do hard things. Yeah, man, well said also, well said. Mm. Because there, there's, there's, there, there'll be a lot of men who think who are still kind of stuck in that kind of, not not time war, but um, in that era, like, you know, I can't share that. It's just, just, I just can't share that. And what you've done, and what what you've brilliantly done in terms of what I saw, is like, man, it's we need to. And there's a lot of men out there who are crying, and because of whatever situation or experiences they had, or the setbacks they've had, they're too afraid to share. And so, also, how do how do you start that? Because I'm, I'm, in your book, you said sitting in your anger. How do we? How do we? How do men or explain to us how does sitting in your anger help an individual? <clears throat> well, anger is a normal emotion, right? Uh, but I believe it's a secondary emotion. So, if it's a secondary emotion, what's the the real emotion underneath the anger? For a lot of us men, it's disappointment, or we feel useless, we feel inadequate, we feel dumb. As soon as a man feels dumb or useless, you've lost him. Mm. And so I always try and get under the secondary emotion of anger because anger can be a good thing if used for the right thing. But because we there's no education around using this anger for positive things, like I'm angry that our domestic violence and suicide rates are what they are. You know, no child in this country should have to live in violent filled homes. That makes me angry. So what do I do with that anger? Do I just sit there and let the anger, you know, brew and do nothing with it and then take out the anger on my wife and children? No. I use that anger to, to cha I channel that anger to talk about things that are very uncomfortable, um, to bring it to the light because we know the boogie monster likes to live in the dark. He likes to hide in that closet. He can't survive when the light's on. When that light's on, our kids are not scared. And so turning on that light is talking about the real stuff that are happening behind closed doors. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. Oh, no, no, <clears throat> awesome, awesome, and it's it's cool because I love it. I love I love I saw the passion, the passion come yeah, out, of, yeah, the yeah. passion because it is. You know, obviously, we we're, we're gonna get them some haters. People who doubt us, like no, that's like, but bro, also the, the work you're doing it speaks for itself. Obviously, Fitz is here as well. He you know he can speak, he can attest to it as well. But also, I, I was there. I saw what you did. It's like the transformation in terms of men who rule staunch men who and, and barbers who come together. And men, just men, just being men, and then all of a sudden just sharing, sharing some of their their deepest darkest secrets. And like I'm sitting there, like, wow, how do you, how do you do that? Also, how do you get to a place? And because and you're right, you're absolutely right. People may look down and nah, that's not going and, and regardless, but you're right. They've never been in the arena. They've never experienced what you've experienced. They've never kind of seen the the, the hardships or, or the struggles that you've been in. And when you bring it forth, imagine thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of men who are like, man, I need help. I'm crying for help. Is there anyone out there? And what you're doing also, you are doing that. You're breaking the mold of, let's not talk about it, let's not share our feelings. But you're doing it in a safe safe space, but also in a space where men don't feel, um, what would we, how, how would we call it? Men don't feel weak or men don't feel like, ah, oh, I just feel like I'm too, too, too soft now. I can't. I can't do this. I feel like like something's taken out of me. That that is, is that some sort of strength. But you do it in a, in a safe manner, in a, in a manner that wow, it brings mana back into our men. So my my Lord love also. My Lord love us with four. Yeah. In terms of what Pete's saying, what are these other agencies missing? Is it rocket science? <laughs> oh man, I mean every agency is different. But the thing is. 
it's the system. It's the system. The system hasn't served our people. The system is, is a dinosaur system that does not serve. Um, and so we need to speak up and question and challenge these systems. How I speak up and challenge these systems is I choose to do the work within my own community. You know, so when we started out was using my business, like no one's going to fund this boy from the hood who's helping me. And so I'm going to fund myself. I'm going to use our business the percentage that we make, the profit that we make from our business is going to go back into helping our community. Because if we wait around all day waiting for, you know, people in power and positions and these systems to come help us and save us, we'll be waiting around forever. Yeah. You know, we'll be waiting around forever. So we need we need our people by our people creating things for our people. And so, um, you know, and don't get me wrong, you know, the people who are in these agencies, you know, are genuine people who, who jump in these agencies because they want to create change, they want to help our people, they see the systems failing our people, but then they get stuck in that system and, it's, and you're pushing shit uphill. Um, so I know the people that I've worked with in, in government and in some of these agencies, they're genuine people who are fighting, you know, for our people, you know, and it's so hard because these systems were written long before them, long mm. before their time. And so how we create that change is from the grassroots, from the ground up in our communities, like what Fitz is doing out in 275, you know, by us, for us, then these people in power will, you know, like, oh, change happening here, this community's coming together. Because when we're together, we're dangerous. Mm. When we're together, when we come together and we come in unity and unison, like, eyes start rolling. Mm -hmm. Like, oh no, here they come. So for anyone that ends up listening to this podcast and they want to be an agent of change and they're like thinking, oh man, I want to I do that for my community. Got any words or encouragement for yeah, someone that's on that just borderline like wanting to do something but just don't know what to do? Just get out there and do it. The greatest thing, the most courageous thing we can ever do is own our story. Mm. is own our story. I picked up some Remington clippers on their box that says, you know, titanium blade, that shit touched Polynesian here, it's blunt. <laughs> but I picked up these clippers, I had my little garden tin shed, I started with what I had. You know, I just got out there and did it. And it just grew organically. I didn't have a five year plan of this is what I'm doing in five years. I knew that I wanted to help my community, but I genuinely started from a place, an organic place of just being authentic of who I was. I'm Matt Brown. I've gone through domestic violence. I'm a survivor of sexual abuse. Um, I haven't perpetrated you know, violence on my wife and my children. This is how I, I changed. This is how I healed. You know, this is how I stopped and broke that cycle. And was there ever a, um, like a time where you're like, you're making progress on dealing with your own trauma and you kind of, are there times where you just want to focus on just yourself and like leave everything because you're giving so much of yourself to others, but there must be times where you're like, honestly, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to just do me and like focus on me and my family and do what makes me happy. Do you ever come across those, yep. those thoughts? I've come across that recently, um, which is why I shut the shop down. Um, I have given my, you know, the last decade of my life to, to our community. Um, and I thought to myself, I want to do something for me and the kids. Uh, my kids, are, our youngest ones are eight and five. So I've only got a small window with them, you know, 10, 10 years max before they become their own people and think dad's not cool anymore. <laughs> um, I want to travel the world. You know, me and the wife, we've always talked about traveling, you know, teaching our, using, you know, the world as our oyster and teaching our kids on, on the world scale. And so this year we're traveling the world. Um, we want to focus on that. We're going to leave Aotearoa for a few months. Um, still work because all my work now is online digitally. So I can always talk to men online um, back here at home. But we want to, you know, be parents and, and show our kids the world and, and us. I want to live for us. Um, you know, so I decided about two years ago that I was going to shut the shop down. Um, we just shut the shop down in May or April, end of April. And so, um, yeah, part of that was working on my health. Um, you know, because when you're in this work, you just work, 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 and you know you forget about yourself. And so, especially for us barbers, you know, our health is like you know we think about ourselves last. Most of us won't eat till we get home late at night at ten after work. Um, so health has been a massive thing, and then um, just being present with my kids. You know, now that they're more aware, like I don't want them always to see mum and dad always working because they do, but I want them to also know that dad is also present. Skills, well done, well done. Am I able to ask a question about your relationship with your um, your elders? Yep, of course. Because, uh, you know, it's hard to judge. Uh, just 
just from what I see, <coughs> you've got this amazing relationship with um, Oceania. And uh, what's that been like in, in terms of like her tr trusting you and um, your growth with her as being her dad? Ah, oh, she's she is the sweetest girl. Um, our oldest girl. Uh, she's been such a gift. Um, when wifey and I got together, she was unsure. Um, she had a, a, a rare disease, which, which she was unsure if she could have babies. And so I said to her, you know, I've always wanted a big <laughs> island family, seven kids or nine kids, because that's the house I grew up in. Um, but I said, if Oceana was all that um, you gifted me, I'll be the happiest man in the world. Um, and so she's been such a treat. Uh, she's the sweetest girl. Um, like any teenager, when they become going to their own, you know, they start rebelling. Um, due to my upbringing and, and the unsafetyness that I experienced, I was always, I'm a very protective father. And so our poor girl, she was never allowed sleepovers. You know, I was like, you're not allowed to sleep in anyone's house. And she would hiss and fight with us, um, especially her mom. Like, man, my story is not their story. Like, don't you trust me? And said, no, Dana, we trust you. I just don't know who's out mm -hmm. there. And your friends may have awesome parents, but I don't know who's going through their doors, you know. And so my job is to keep you safe. You know, until you're 18 and you become independent and do what, do what you want to do, sweet. But until then, you're stuck here. Your your friends can come have sleepovers here, um, you know, of us talking to their parents, but no sleepovers. <coughs> she hated that. She absolutely hated that. And I would say to her, you know, if your one trauma in life is mom and dad were strict, then... I'm happy with that, like, I'm happy to have that. Anyways, um, she turned 18, and I asked her, what do you want to do for your birthday, darling? And she said, sleepover. I was like, oh, who's coming over? She's like, no, no, I'm going to sleep at my friend's. I was like, oh, frick. Um, so she had a sleepover, and you know what? She rings us um, late at night, crying, emotional, and I said, what's wrong? Like, I was like, something wrong, I'll come pick you up. She goes, no, I just want to say thank you to your mum for protecting me. Because she's sitting around in a circle with her friends, her closest friends, five of them, and they were all shocked. Like they couldn't believe that this was Oceana's first sleepover. And so they're like, why? She tells them why, because my dad's story, he's very protective. Mum and dad work in the sector of, you know, domestic violence and abuse, blah, blah, blah. All her friends start crying and they said, We wish our parents protected us, like your parents. And she's like, What do you mean? It's like, We've all been abused. All the girls, one by one, opened up how they were all touched. And it wasn't stranger danger. It was a family member. It was a friend of the house. And so when we talk about statistics of, you know, who's being abused, like you're not going to see the real, the reality mm. because most survivors don't open up till 20, 30 years plus. Yeah. So Jeez. I was a strict dad, but it was worth it. And so right now she's 20 now, you know, that was two years ago. <laughs> She's like, I'm so, so grateful. Like, we're the best parents in the world. So I'm like, sweet. You tell your little siblings that because <laughs> yeah. we're going to be going through the same thing with them. <laughs> that yeah. would have been tough, though, man, during the it was yeah, tough. Her teenager years. And, and I put a post up on socials about it a few years ago when she was, like, 15. <laughs> I got pushback from parents who, you know, let their kids go out. I was like, sorry. We have a close friend who's been a, a child psychologist for 20 years. She said, if people removed... If, if people remove sleepovers, you would remove 90% of the sexual abuse that we have in our backyard. Jeez, man. If people removed sleepovers in this country, you would remove, eliminate 90% of the sexual 90%. abuse that happens in this country. Damn. You, you know what's interesting, Matt? It seems like it's been coming out um, more often now. People are, are sharing some of their stories. Mm. Um, I think... I think just one of those one of the comments. Someone um, after forty four years, they're able to kind of open up and share some of the some of the stories and some of the, some of their pain around sexual abuse and so forth. So, what's what's your, what's the climate? What, what, what are you what are you gauging in terms of our men now? Obviously, we talk about vulnerability and sharing, and also the domestic violence. But what do you think? Is the is there progress? Obviously, there's progress uh, in terms of sharing, but. What are you seeing in terms of what, what our men need uh, in this day and age, especially our, our young men? They need, we need more empathy. We need more empathy. The thing that cripples so many of us men, so many of our tane, so many of the tamalo that I work with is the shame, you know. And, and so I want to make that clear. Shame and guilt are two different things. You know, guilt is I've, I feel I've done something bad. Yes, you've done something bad. You should feel guilty. Now, let's hope that guilty moves into you, you know, 
becoming a better person. But shame, what shame is, I am bad. There is nothing good about me. I'm an innately horrible person. I should just disappear. That's what shame is. Shame is I am not good enough. I am bad. I am evil, blah, blah, blah. The only way we eliminate shame is when we can bring that shame to the light and meet it with empathy and sympathy and compassion. We have to, or else the cycle just carries on. You know, these men who carry the shame, you know, some, some of the boys and men, some of the Gs, some of the hardest men in society that I've had the honour to sit with in prisons, gang members, presidents of gangs that I've sat with and cried with, these men have harboured that same shame the sexual abuse that happens to them from their uncle, from Uncle Bully, whoever, um, aunties, you know, from women as well, they've kept the shame because they were scared if they spoke up, dad would have done something, which means that dad would have ended up in prison. Mm. So the shame that we keep destroys us, but we have to meet that with compassion and empathy. Mm. And often a lot of the guys who have sat in my chair, you know, like, bro, you're not the best barber, but we come to you because we know that you're going to meet us with you know, mm. empathy and compassion. Oh, man. And I love this. Um, and thanks for sharing the story about uh, your daughter and the sleepovers. Uh, one thing uh, you said before was um, that you wanted your children to grow up in an environment of hard conversations. And I imagine that um, as a parent who's gone through things, trying to help your children understand some of those things without them experiencing it can be quite difficult. And... I suppose, um, I'm assuming here that creating an environment where you can have hard conversations with your children requires you first to be the one to open up, to step up and sort of model what that looks like. Um, can you talk about what that experience has been like and how do you find it in terms of when you start having hard conversations younger, as the children, again, assuming my kids aren't that old yet, but I'm assuming as they get older and wiser and there's a bit more pushback and so how do you sort of manage that and still keep that environment of safety and, and you know? Well, in our household, we have ground rules. You know, our number one rule is nothing is ever off the table. You know, nothing is ever off the table. You know, this table, we welcome hard, courageous conversations. So you can talk about however you want to feel or whatever's going through in your mind or your day. We bring that to the, to the, to the low low, to the table, and we have those conversations Um how we deal with that, how mum and dad um, react to that, that's, you know, give us our, give us permission to feel what we need to feel. But always know that our intention will always be your safety and you first. You are, you will always be our priority, how you guys feel and, and what matters to you guys. And so we try and raise our kids in that environment, um, and, but we model that. We model that. Me and wifey, we, we, some of our date nights, we will sit there and ask each other hard questions, you know, just for our date night, like, you know, what about me do you do you dislike the most? Or when in my life, when are now, since our relationship, where you've um, felt resentment towards me? So we sit there for a date night and we just ask these hard questions. Um, our ch children grow up around those courageous <laughs> conversations. And we have them. We sit there and we cry in front of our kids. Um, just so our kids are learning this emotional literacy, you know. We want them to be mm. emotionally aware. And it pays off, you know. I read my son's half midterm report. This, just the other day, you know, before school holidays, we're sitting here, and on the report, it, you know, the teacher wrote, you know, your son is very compassionate, very empathetic, very emotionally aware, and he's only eight years old. You know, he's the first kid to ask how other kids are. He worries, he thinks about other kids and, and wants them to speak up. If they don't speak up, then he's the one to speak up. So, you know, just raising them in that mm. culture that this is normal for them, um, it's totally different than what I grew up in. We had courageous conversations, but it was like <laughs> one way. <laughs> it was like, I'll tell you exactly how I feel. <laughs> so. Yeah, do, do you bad memories? Do you bad memories? <laughs> how, do, how do you keep your emotions intact when, like, like you explained that? I figured, oh, Matt must be calm all the time. Like, the daughter's probably going, oh, God, this is boy I like it. You're like, oh, that's very nice. Okay, but how, what's it really like? How do you keep those emotions intact? Are you able to share? I, have I you try lost your cool? I've Just so I know, I'm humanising you. I'm looking at you, I'm thinking, yes, who? <laughs> <laughs> nah, I am not perfect. You know, I haven't, I've never perpetrated physical violence to oh. my wife, but I've used colourful words. Okay. You know, I am not perfect. I've lost my shit many times. Um, so it's taken a lot of work, you know. I mm. talk to the right people who, who 
given me the right insights and tools and I've just learned to regulate myself more you know the more I've I've done been on this journey of healing it's it's learning to regulate myself um pain always comes from inside not externally it's always an internal thing first so asking myself okay what's happening here why am I triggered why am I wanting to react why am I wanting to punch the wall um you know and so just the to breathe and think first before I speak has been a hard skill to learn you know but it takes practice it's not you don't wake up and <laughs> you know <laughs> shoulders now, and I ask that because I'm struggling at the moment with um having these tough conversations because I know it might trigger something for me and so I'll just keep silent or I won't address it and so I think you know having this conversation now it's like okay there's some work to be done like for me and um, and if I want, I guess, um, the progress that I want to see with me and my daughter and my family, then i got to do the work. And so, so thank you also for um, yeah, sharing some of your insight of family time. And, and that, that's something I'm going to honestly do because <laughs> we pride ourselves in terms of the podcast, nothing is off the table. And then yeah. hearing you in terms of like how you guys navigate your conversations at home and and so yeah I yeah thank you <laughs> pleasure also but also understanding is, is finding the people in your corner because not all, yeah, not yeah, all yeah. the time you know your kids are going to be wanting to open up to you yeah. so we have the people you know Sarah's sister um, my kids aren't you know that's their, one of their, fa- oh, their favourite auntie I'll say that um, they can go and talk to her about anything so we know that she's there because she will come and you know tell us that this is what's happening cool. and so as we trust her you know so mm. she's also one of our kids people that's good also. That's good. Man, man. It is, it is. It's just, um, I don't know, Matt. Also, it's just, it's just, I think in the last week, we've had some other guests come on and just, it just seems like it's popping up, just popping, just all this, all these, all this trauma. And it's, it's just, it is really hard, really sad to, to hear. Um, also, in terms of, uh, in terms of us as men, what, what are your thoughts in terms of us as men? Do you think right now it's really hard in this era to, to, to be a man? And, and also toxic, toxic masculinity. Is there? What are your thoughts on, around those issues and what you're seeing in, in this day and age for us as men? Hmm. Good question. Do I think it's hard for us men? Or th- more, more harder now in this in this era? What, what do you think? What are your thoughts? I think every generation has its challenges. You know, when I think back to my dad's generation, I couldn't think of a world where I just harbored and held everything, and that would be hard for me. You know, I, I'm someone who prefers to talk it out. You know, sometimes I can't, and I have to go for savali vali for you know to, to cool down. Um, but I, I I I would find it hard to 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 not talk. Um, and then the previous generation, I think of the men who went to war. Like mm-hmm. that's freaking hard. I couldn't see myself, you know, mm-hmm. running up with a gun trying to protect my nation who don't know me or don't care. Um, but I'm gonna do this anyway because I'm patriotic. You know trying to save my country uh, that's hard and so when I think of our generation we have our own challenges that are hard you know um, like when I talk to my that my elders they're like you know, what is this feelings thing that you're talking about like that is freak they find that hard <laughs> you know and so I think yeah, all of us every generation has our hard things do I think um, I mean finding it hard today yes we're finding it hard to navigate the conversation of feelings to navigate courageous conversations, to navigate our trauma, because this is the first generation that we've ever been told to feel. You know, what does feeling look like? And if I start feeling, what am I going to be met with? You want me to open up? If I open up, what am I going to be met with? Mm. You know, are you going to force me to, to shut up again and I'm going to run and hide in my back cave or am I going to be free? And so I just, what I try and do with all my mahi is just try and model what healthy masculinity looks like in our day and age. To me, healthy masculinity looks like showing up for myself because in return, when I show up for myself, I can show up for the people that I love the most. And that's my wife and my children. And then everyone else after that. So is that hard? It's hard because I have to do the inner work. You know? mm. But once I do that work, that's the hardest work is doing that inner work. Once that work is done, everything else is a breeze. Like, bro, I know what you got for me. I got you, so I've been there. you know. But I'm, I'm happy to sit here and not give any answers or not feedback, but just know that I'm here. I'm here. And great answer also, because you, we've been hearing it a lot of times in terms of toxic masculinity, men, it's, it's a, you know, demonised and, and so forth. But great answer. 
you know, showing up. I like it in terms of showing up. So we, for us as, as men, do you think a lot of men have have failed in terms of showing up or still trying to figure out what showing up means for them? Yeah, I think the struggle is navigating what does showing up look like because I think for a, my dad's generation, showing up for them looked like putting food on the table. You know, if I don't go to work, son, you got you don't have any school uniform, there's no A on the table, can't pay the rent, there's no power. You know, so showing up for my dad's generation was going to do the work. But with us growing up in this fast, you know, paced social media world, showing up for us is actually, you know, seeing me dead, you know, like uh, affirming me, telling me that you're proud of me. That's what's showing up. But his generation, they, that was not showing up for them. So we need, we need more understanding um, for each other, for our, especially for our men, you know, who are navigating. This is hard. We're... Courageous conversations, I feel women for a long time have been better at that than men. And I say that because, you know, I've worked in hair salons where women will just pour their hearts out, you know, where for men it may take them five haircuts for them to then start pouring out their hearts to their barber. Um, if they pour it out in the first haircut, then cool. But for a lot of men, some of the guys that I've sat with has taken them a year for them to then start pouring out their hearts. It's like, you know, everyone's different. I don't believe a one-size-fits-all approach to healing and doing the work. Um, it's just meeting people and that's the beautiful thing about our indigenous values you know words like whakafanungatanga which is really just walking alongside people accompanying them with where they're at not rolling out a how to heal mm -hmm. list a recipe <laughs> list of you know but you know I can make it this is my roadmap you can also create your own roadmap I love that you said that because often in, as practitioners or people working with others it's like we always think that um, one thing that works for a group or a person works for everyone else. And so you having hundreds of men come to your chair, like, was it tough not projecting someone else's experience or your past experience of healing with someone else over this person that's in front of you? Like, have you been challenged like, oh, hurry up. Like someone else must might have shared their story in one day and then it's taken like 10, 10 haircuts to get to a place that you, you want to see. How do you keep yourself in check and not like get frustrated? Like, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> this is when, how, do you, how do you not fuck up with it? Or have you ever fought like that? No, no, no. no I, I've always just tried to be patient. Like, you know, mm -hmm. when, when they're ready, yeah. it's, it's not my job to force anything, yeah. you know, but it's my job just to hold the space. Cool. Um, and that's the thing like, I think we've society we've created a society of fixes we have to fix things but the magic actually happens the in the process in the waiting it's not you know how do we get from A to C the magic is in the B like what does the B process look like I mean it looks like sitting there and some sometimes the most effective work that I've found in my work is just sitting with people, you know? Yes, it is good to give people solutions and, and give them, you know, tips on how to, or insights, but sometimes just sitting with people, people are just like, oh, I feel seen. Oh, someone actually cares and listens. That does much more than, oh bro, this is, I've been there, do this, I was like, <laughs> like, relax bro. <laughs> I'm not cool. talking to you now. <laughs> cool. And if you're in the business of care, um, I hope you guys are listening. Stop trying to give quick fixes to our people. <laughs> Sit, man. Be part of the process. So, especially general, for our people, so, like yeah. we've wanted, we've been, we're voiceless. We've mm. wanted to tell our stories for so long, and now we have people in positions who are, you know, getting the academics, who are telling our stories and doing the research. Like we just want to be heard, you know. And if you're not going to hear us. You're gonna see us, mm. you know, and and you only need to look at you know our our, our youth crime statistics with mm. all the ram raids that are happening. Like our kids want to be seen and heard, and if you're not gonna see and hear them, you mm. will witness what they do. Yeah, introducing ram raids, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which have been a thing for a long time, you know. And all of a sudden, it's glamorized. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Also? Oh man, honestly, I, I'm excited having this talk with you because. As you're sharing, I'm getting amped up and this it's giving me fire around like the work that um, we hope to do not only on this platform but the some of the work we do mm. outside of this, like um Betia's work and school teacher here, 
I used to be a youth worker to work or stood down. Nah. Um, but <laughs> it's not part of the work. He's a pastor. He's a pastor. Not even. I say that because <laughs> I'm going to get stood down from my, my pastor. <laughs> oh, I forgot what the question was. Oh, yeah. What are your thoughts on Ren Raid? Ren Raids. Uh, I think it's um, it's such a complex complex issue, you know. With these, who, who are we to blame? We can blame the parents. We can blame, like, mum and dad need to go to work, you know. Living costs are so high, like who's going to them, you know, pay for our living? So they have to go to work. So our kids are being raised by each other. And then that's been glamorized due to social media. Like it's such a complex issue. Mm. I just think we really need to come off, come up with a solution. Not a, it's not a one size, you know, fits all approach to, to helping this issue of our rangatahi. Um, but I do know that children want to be seen and they want to be heard. Mm. What that looks like is different for all of us. Shalosu. Mm. That's my answer of sidestep. <laughs> 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 I was waiting for the uh, colonization. <laughs> well, listen, like, there's, there's different levels. Like, that's the thing. Like, how how system, far do we blame? Yeah, Who, yeah, how far yeah, do right, we go? Right. So, for me, in my sector of domestic violence and sexual violence and, and you know mental health, like this is the lane I've chosen to stay in. Yes, we can blame all that. You know, colonization, so many things. But for me, I'm going to take responsibility of what I can do which is my family, my community, and I'm gonna run with that, you know. I'm not gonna blame everyone else. Yes, the effects of colonization plays a massive part, but I'm not gonna stay victim to mm. that. I'm gonna create a new narrative, create new wealth for my kids and their kids. That's awesome, Wait, awesome. Model, model. So that's, that's awesome, I like that, I like that, I like that a lot, um, Matt, because uh, yeah, we can we can sit here around the table and talk about colonization and racism and all that kind of stuff, the system, but if we're not going to get up of our own asses and go, hey, you know what? I'm going to make it. I'll be the change. I'll be the change. I'll do something. I'll break the cycle and do something. You're absolutely right. And and not fall victim to like, oh, it's hopeless. I can't do anything. And what you're doing right now, also, you you, you, you like um, Charles was saying, and you might not even like to be called a trendsetter or, and so forth, a trailblazer. But also, whether you like it or not, also, you, you, it's starting. It's um, people are catching on. Men are catching on. People are following suit and like, man, I can see this and. Also, man, much, yeah, man, my lord, I just, I just, yeah, it's just one of those things I just get, like what Charles <laughs> is saying, you know, I, I, I get it, I get it what you're saying, and it's up to us for, as people, as Pacifica and Modi, to get up and do things, like, just really, actually, you said, get up, get up and do things, we had, last week, we had um, Agnes, and she said, um, she mentioned you and your wife, and she said, one of the biggest things that we always talk about on social media, and put on Facebook, is, hey, how are you, how are you, brother, how are you, sis, Oh, you or just chicken on, on, and they always say chicken, chicken on them, but they never chicken on them. They never actually go up and chick on the actual person, but they say, "Yeah, I'll chick up with you." Know, just chick in on them, but they never do that. Mm. And so she said that you were the epitome. You and your wife the, were the epitome of actually saying, "Hey, how are you, Uso? How are you, bro?" And they actually going there. How much do you see? How much of that of saying those words and not actually activating the chicken? How much of, of that has been a barrier and been a detrim detriment for our people and more so our, our men? Massive, because, you know, actions speak louder than words. Um, words, the thing of our people is words are power. You know, mm. we're, we're a culture of, culture of orators, so words have always held weight within our people. We can laugh it off and mock each other about it, but whether you like it or not, words give life. Mm. And so I'm always intentional with my words. As a barber, you get in, you get stuck in your, you know, your trade. Oh, sup, bro? How you doing? Handshake, bro, hug, sit down, have the conversation. But then I'm always intentional. Okay, I'm, he he just answered mm. the the quick answer. I'm all good. Five minutes into the haircut, so also, how are you really doing? And you ask with intention and meaning and weight behind that. When you, a guy, the thing when you're talking with men, men can smell when you're fake. Mm -hmm. Men know when you're about it and, and you really care. So when I ask, how are you really doing also? You know, then, oh, this guy, oh, what's that warm feeling? This guy really cares. You know, he really wants to know. And so always being gentle with the, how I treat carefully um, with these people. You know, it's, I, I never want to trample on people's manna. You know, it's always being gentle with my approach and caring. Um, that's all I try and do. It's just to, just the care. So simple here, Matt. So simple, but yet sometimes it's freaking simple. Really Stop complicating it and yeah. adding sacred babble on it. Like, yeah. Just simplify yeah. it. And our people have always known the answers. Tala noa, va fialawai. Just to sit mm. down and and fulfil the fala. Like that's all we do. Mm. Stop complicating it. 
being with people is not a hard thing. We have known how to be with people since the beginning of age. Be with people looks like sitting, being present, staring in their eyes and saying, I see you, I acknowledge you, I accept you. So true. We get so Do hungry. you think we're losing that art of connection? Because we've, man, we've just come out of COVID, everyone's stuck in their homes and then everything's now online. And so we hardly have, oh, I don't know, we're still, we're coming out of it, so we're trying to get used to connection again. Do you think we're losing the art or? I think it's changing. It's, it's changing, it's changing, it's changing. So the kanohiki, the kanohi, the face-to-face, the wha whaiwai that we, you know, sit face-to-face, we, you know, have this talanoa. It's still a thing, but I think our kids, they're growing up in the digital age mm-hmm. where kanohiki te kanohi looks totally different. It's looking more digital. So to them, it's very real. To me, it's like, that's just social media. That's not real. But to my kids, it's very real. You know? <coughs> who likes their um, posts, who comments on their posts is very real, real and has weight. And so we have to navigate that space as parents, as adults, um, and listen to our children. You know, If this is real for you, then let's try and create a safe space for that, which has led on to our latest project. Um, our app. I said to throw that in there, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's yeah, talk yeah, about yeah, this yeah, app. Yeah, inner boy, is it? Yes, inner boy. Mm. Cool. Mm. Yeah, inner boy. Nz. We we started this. We released this. This was released. Um, this the idea of the concept of inner boy um, was birthed during lockdown. I had jumped on national television and did an interview with Dr. Ange Jury, the CEO of Women's Refuge. And I don't know what came over me, but I got all confident and said, you know, if there's any brother out there struggling with violence, struggling with his mental health, um, or hurting himself or, you know, his family, please reach out to me. I promise I'll respond. Next minute, thousands and thousands of messages came through on social media. So during lockdown, that six week period that we were, you know, stuck at home, I was up till three o'clock in the morning every day, messaging, messaging to people, writing back to people. And what really broke my heart was when a 12-year-old boy messaged through and said, Matt, I seen you on national television last night. You said that you help men who struggle with anger. Can you please help me help my dad who's abusing my little brother? And when he missed, when I read that message, I broke down and cried. My heart broke because it's not our children's job to regulate our emotions, mm-hmm. us as the parents and the adults. And so I jumped online, tried to find help. All the anger management courses that were online were outdated, Whitewash, didn't sound like us, um, you know, cost money, was inaccessible for our people. And so wifey and I decided we need to create something digital because 94% of Aotearoa of New Zealand are currently online. Everyone's on their phone, on the internet. So we need to infiltrate the space talking about these hard conversations that we, you know, struggle to talk about. And so Inner Boy was birthed, um, which is the concept behind Inner Boy is seeing the inner child within every man. It's teaching men how to regulate their emotions and reparent themselves. Because if you've never seen or been modeled what a healthy parent looks like, you have to model that to yourself now and teach him and train him. So. Yeah, wow, well done, man. Congrats. Also. It's already out. Is it coming out soon? Yeah, it just released last week. Wow. So our goal was to get, um, the first year was to get 10,000 men engaged. Um, currently, it's um, the first day, the first 24 hours was we had 36 and a half thousand people. Engaged, so and that's unheard of. You know, to have men Absolutely. engaged in that is is is, is amazing. Man, man, is it easily easily accessible for our men? Yes. Yep. So again, we wanted it to be free for the user. Um, so the government jumped on board, loved the concept, and and funded it. And so um, it's easy and it's free. Um, it's not on the app store yet because we're still working on the phase two. So phase one's open. It's so for thirty minutes for thirty days. And yeah, however long it takes you but for 30 minutes for 30 days we wanted it to be achievable and sizable for our men simplifying it all this research has come from the barbershop from talking to men mm. over the last two decades you know what would help for you what would work for you and men have responded like just simplifying it we don't need to see the academic you know, mm. language like just no psycho babble just straight to the heart just heart language stuff black and white that will resonate with us mm. and so we wanted to create inner boy um, yeah inner boy was birthed and so just put it in your web browser innerboy.nz and then it's there wow cool and I've had a quick look at it too and um, man one of the videos really powerful man and so um, it's awesome how you captured it as well and um, 
one of the videos talks they give you like tools as well eh? yes. and so um anyone can use it even doesn't anyone matter what level I mean, we, we've had a few women use it and they cool. they've they're applying yeah, it to themselves right. like I mean, used to say inner boy. Again, this was us, me targeting my audience. Yep. My audience has always been men. I've worked in this barber shop space. Um, so, you know, I haven't worked in the woman's space, and so yeah, anyone can use it. You know, but we, we've targeted you know men, men cool. from the age of eighteen to forty-five. But again, we've had older men use it, younger boys using it in schools now. So, well done. It's well amazing. done. It's amazing, even man. Uh, um, sorry. I, probably off topic but how do you keep yourself like humble in terms of like not getting any of this work to your head because for extroverts or other people it's easy for them like to be like oh yeah that's right this is me i'm the best barber or like <laughs> i'm doing this work <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, your father, that, I'm your father <laughs> that's right i'm your daddy nah. <laughs> how do you keep yourself humble or so grounded um uh, mm-hmm. I don't know. I think um, I, I have a strong wife who keeps me in check. Um, but I also know the work is not about me. It's not. It's about our children. It's about my children's children. You know, it's never about the the seeds that we plant today. I know that I will never eat the fruit from. But my hope is that my children's children will eat the fruit, mm. or my children's children will sit under that tree. You know. So knowing that that's the motive. Like, why why is it about me? It's not about me. You know, I'm honoured that I'm in the space. I'm honoured that men trust me. And so it's really them. They've given me the power. They've given me the gift. It's not what I can do. They've gifted me their mana, their stories. And so my job is just to tread lightly and be respectful of these stories. Mm, that's awesome. What a journey. What a journey, man. Because did you ever, did you ever imagine your wildest imagination like man the journey thus far your trajectory would, would change and shift and you're doing all these amazing things also and impacting lives did you even as a kid growing up like it would have been far-fetched like nah this is no way and you look now like wow this is what what's happened and it, all because of all because people think oh well this had to there was a purpose as to why this happened but do you do you see that do you do you view it that way like i view all the hardship that i the struggle that i've experienced and, and viewed it was just it was just meant to be and and this is what where my life is right now and what I'm doing right now. No, not my at all. If if I could if you told me that one day I would live my dream life, I would never believe you. Um and I've even heard people say, you know, so you are you grateful that you went through what you went through because you wouldn't be who you are today? I'm like, Hell no. I would never wish, you know, what I had been through, what I've what I was subjected to to even you know, the, the worst person that has annoyed me or broken my heart, I wouldn't wish it on anyone, you know. Um, so am I grateful? Hell no, I wish I never experienced this, what I experienced. But I will use that, um, that mama, that pain as my gift to my children, that this is not the life that you kids will ever experience. It's yeah. awesome. What, what is the hope for your children? That they are just good humans, that um, whatever field they choose to, to work in or pursue, that um, they change that world, you know. So whether it's in tech or whether it's in the mental health or social work or, or you know, doctor. You know, every someone wants their kid to be a doctor or, <laughs> or, lawyer, or, lawyer. or a lawyer or like, you know, whatever field that they choose. I just hope my children are not selfish mm-hmm. and they are always kind. And your hope for New Zealand? My hope for New Zealand is a violence-free Aotearoa. Awesome. Their women and children do not suffer at the hands of unregulated men. And our statistics come down. So when people say, I'm honoured and humble, when people say, you're doing awesome work, our statistics, our statistics do not show that. You know. So until these statistics change, and for someone who knows that those statistics are not even accurate, because majority of people do not ring up. You know, In this country, one in every four minutes, someone rings up the police due to, domestic, due to domestic violence. One in every four minutes. For majority of my mum's hidings, she'd never rang the police. You know, because when the police would come, they would then put their hands on dad. You know, and so she didn't want dad to go to prison. She just wanted him to stop, you know, abusing her. And so she never rang the police. You know, so the times that she did ring the police, you know, they came over and and, and touched head, t- put their hands on dad. And so those statistics are horrific. Our statistics here in New Zealand are horrific. Um, but I never talk about the statistics because I know with all my heart and the stories that I've been gifted from men that. The stats on the table are not accurate 
to the pandemic that is domestic violence in our backyard. That's awesome. Can perpetrators change? A hundred percent. I have to believe. I have to believe that that people who perpetrate violence are redeemable. Because I was always the kid at home wishing and hoping when dad did a long lag for domestic violence, for abusing us, that when he would get out, that he would change. Unfortunately, that day never came. Um, even losing mum, my she was still getting abused um, two years ago. And so I work harder today. Um, you know, when, when we wrote our book, um, I wanted it to be in the hands of every person incarcerated in this country. Every person incarcerated, you know, Penguin, our publisher, they said, you know, well, we want to sell books. And I said, well, I want to give them away for free. Um, again, trying to make healing accessible for our people. And so we raised the money. It cost us $100,000, you know, thanks to a, a few different organisations. Um, we raised the money. And so every person in prison, incarcerated, uh, in two, 2021, 9,350 people were incarcerated. 60% of those people are Indigenous people, are Māori and Pacifica. Every person got a book. And since then, the messages that we've received have been so, has, has been the honour of my life. To, to have men, you know, I had a brother before we, 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 we closed shop, he just got released out of Mount Eden. And he said, bro, when I got out, when I was released, you know, I had 20 men come to the gate and tell us, when you go see Matt Brown, because he's from Christchurch, when you go see Matt Brown and get a haircut, please send him our love. Tell him thank you for changing our lives, changing the way that we think. You know, to receive messages from women, women saying, this is the first time my husband's ever apologised to me. You know, mm -hmm. to hearing children voice messages to us and, and writing us letters. You know, this is the first time I've ever heard my father apologise to us, say sorry to mum for the abuse, the chaos that he created. You know, your book has changed my father's life. And so when I hear that, I have to believe that people who perpetrate violence are redeemable. You see, I say people because to me, I have to humanise them. I don't want to label them perpetrators. Yes, they have perpetrated violence, but if we want our country to heal, if we want people who perpetrate violence to heal, we have to humanise them. And humanising them looks like connecting with the victim. Mm. Because over 90% of the men who, have been per who are in prison right now, incarcerated, were once upon a time a victim themselves. Over 90% of people incarcerated have been sexually abused. That's a real horrific statistic in our country. So if we don't see the inner child, connect with the inner child, heal the inner child, mm. how can we connect with and heal with the, heal the adult? So we have to heal the victim. Mm. So sorry, why we're still on topic, because you've mentioned it before, and it's in your book, we, um, this line, you say, um, if, we won't, if we won't transform, we will transmit. Are you able to unpack that? Because I think it's quite a powerful um, phrase. It's always an inside job first. You know, it, It's an inside job first. So if you do not transform the pain, the trauma that you carry, that all of us have carried you know, for as long as we've been alive, if you do not transform that, you will transmit. You will transmit that. And how we see, because pain demands to be felt. Shame demands to be felt. You know, it's just the way our body, it's the way we're created. We are beings who feel. We are beings who feel first. And so if this demands to be felt, it will manifest. How that manifests, we see that played out in society. We see substance abuse. We see violence. We see anger. All this pain and trauma that these men have carried, especially those who have, you know, experienced sexual violence or domestic violence, family violence. Like, I've only ever seen dad communicate this way, you know, hands on mum. So this is completely normal. If you do not transform that, you will transmit that. You will transmit that. And so I, I'm a massive encourager of becoming a transformer. Um, and not a transformer as in a changes guy, but, you know, transformer yeah. where you've transformed your pain and you've created something beautiful. Now let's transmit that beauty to our community. And and I love, like, how you... And you've mentioned for, throughout the podcast, like, we need to take responsibility mm. for not only our healing but also our transformation and um, taking ownership, ownership for it right. and, yes. yeah. and it's easy easier said than done because I think sometimes when we are going through stuff it's like oh man the world's against me and you feel a bit weak and don't know how to get out of that rut but 
at the end of the day we'll, we'll respond we can take responsibility for it and so i think i'm really encouraged by that and i hope whoever's i'm um, listening in that man you you have um you're resilient and you have um you are courageous you are strong enough to take that responsibility and be able to transform so Amen. thank you so much also for we can do hard things eh? yeah, yeah that's the motto we can do hard things. <laughs> So, so much <laughs> this, really this has been deep. <laughs> yeah, I know. Actually, it is, it let's, is. Uh, let's talk about triangle and these. <laughs> nah, nah, sorry, sorry. Oh, carry man. on. This is, this is one of those moments where you need a cigar. You need a cigar. But that's what I mean. Like, we, we, we sat here for, you know, the last hour or so Jeez. and had these courageous conversations, talked about tapu things without needing to have a beer, you know, mm. without needing to have any substance. You know, let's puff, puff, give. Like, no, we don't need to do that. We can actually do hard things. Mm. Yeah. And that's what we're not used to, you know. We, we're we're so we're a society that runs whenever we feel hard things. But we need to, if, if for men of old who went to war and built resilience, you know, carrying these guns and going to war for us, our war is different. We can build resilience mm. with how we feel. You know, that's our war. Completely two different, but it's still a war, you know, because we're losing men. Mm. We're losing men at the hands of men. We're killing our. We're, we're taking our own lives. And so that's the war that we're fighting here. You know, we're taking our, our partners' lives, we're taking our children's lives. That's the war we're fighting. You know, so we can do hard things. Mm -hmm. We have to do hard things. With people creating a safe space and having these hard conversations, um, can you still do it with substance, sub, substance abuse or taking substances? Like with alcohol prison or being able to... I think so. I think so. I mean, I'm not a massive encourager of that. Um, I think whatever is your advice, um, but until you see it become um, a distraction mm. of the hard thing, until it becomes your vice or your choice of drug, more than actually doing the hard things and having the courageous conversations, that's when it becomes dangerous. So to me, it's a slippery slope, um, you know, because again, those vices can, can also be a distraction to the hard things that we're feeling, you know. And I found with this inner boy, people who are doing it already, who have had addiction, substance addiction, um, are struggling, you know. Like, it's hard to feel these feelings without mm. taking a joint, you know, because the joint relaxes you and does whatever it does to your brain. Mm. Um, so again, it's another escape, escapism. That's good, that's good. Just a harsh, harsh reality, eh, Matt? It is. Um, as we speak, I mean, this Dalanoa, like you said, that uh, what, what, one, what, one person, what, uh, what, within four minutes, is it? You say, yeah, um, yeah, one person in every four minutes, minutes. rings so the police, bringing the police, and whether if it's domestic <laughs> violence or whatever it is, and you look, you think of the harsh reality and some of those stats you're saying is quite alarming, and so, and for us to even have this conversation, you know, it is it's going to turn some heads in terms of oh my gosh. Um, but it is, it's much needed also. It's much, much, needed. much needed. We need to have to having these conversations and having, and the reality is, the reality is, as we're talking, we don't even know the person next door is probably getting abuse. person down the road is mm. probably getting their ass kicked from mom or dad or whoever. And we're here and sometimes we're in our comfort zone. We have no idea. And it pays, like you said, I think the, what, the thing that was most alarming also, you said earlier, was that people at church knew that mom was getting abused and they did nothing. They never voiced anything or approach you and your family. I think that's what makes me really, that wrecks me up also. It really is like, wow. Not just, I'm not just saying about the church, but people in general, when people see things and witness things or hear things and turn a blind eye, I think that's so sad that we do that or we, we would even consider doing that. Mm. Uh, it's, it is, it's the harsh reality and it's very really sad also and I think it's people who need more people like you more people like Fitz uh, people out there more women out there men out there and who are actually saying come on if you need help we're here we'll, be, we'll stand in the gap we'll stand in the gap and actually say no, no be intentional like you were saying not just say oh well, this is us we're, we're a service we do this and not even be there and not even walk the talk I think that's that's, that's quite alarming that's where my my um, I guess yeah, my rift is with that. I was like, wow, and and I think to myself, wait, 
am I am I guilty of that myself? And I probably have been also. I probably have been in terms of oh, I see someone who needs help. Oh, I'm too busy. Oh, 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 chicken also. Hey, also, I'll be there. Oh, yeah, we'll see you. And I'll turn up. I think that it makes me personally. I think, oh man, I'm guilty of that as well. Mm. And so I'm not, not 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 trying to judge anyone, but it's sad. It's sad that the harsh reality is that there are people out there who are getting abused, getting domestic violence, and whatever. And yet, some of some of us of us have the capacity to help, but yet we don't help. Yeah. If it if 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 it takes a village to raise a child, mm-hmm. where is this village? Yeah. And this is why I refuse to shut up when I talking about this stuff because in my line of work and the men that I've sat with in prisons and the barbershop and therapy groups people are struggling silently you know people are struggling silently and not just that not just the men but our children are witnessing this you know you got to think if a child is watching his mom getting the shit beaten out of him or watching dad you know abuse himself and you know substance abuse etc etc like what do you think that does to a child you know, that's again transmitting that pain onto the child, and that's that's the definition of intergenerational trauma. The cycle just carries on until we have the courage as a community to come together and say this shit stops now. Mm. And as uncomfortable as it is, and people, you know, I've had pushback since I was fifteen talking about domestic violence. I came out at fifteen in your three minute speech in English, where you have to do your three minute speech. I decided to talk about domestic violence. The pushback I got from my community, from the Pacifica community, I was like, "Bro, like, that shit happens to all of us, but you're bringing shame to our culture, especially to your parents. Shut up." For me, it was either shut up, take my own life, or speak up. So I've been speaking up since then, and since speaking up, more other men around the motu, around this country, have spoken up. And so, yeah, we need to have these courageous yeah, conversations yeah, yeah. and hate it all you want and say it's unsafe. Um, I've seen amazing, beautiful things. I've seen men redeem themselves, men who were gang leaders, who were patch members, you know, change and become the fathers that they ne- themselves never witnessed, you know, and are now living violent free lives. So you can say it's unsafe all you want because you are not in this arena yeah, sitting yeah. with our men and listening to what they need. And you was really unsafe, eh, Matt, is not having the conversations, eh? That's exactly. unsafe. That's exactly. Mm-hmm. Turning a blind eye is unsafe. Jeez. So yeah. you only feel unsafe because you're uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. Don't project you're unsafe and uncomfortable to me. <laughs> yeah, so. I don't, I don't. How about if you're, because some of us have that hood mentality, like, you know, snitches get stitches. Like, how do you battle that? Like, if you're someone that's grown up on that, like, if you see something, you know something, but you don't want to say anything because it's like, ah, oh, that's their business. Or, um, how's that working for us? Is my <laughs> question. Yeah. You know, how's how snitch culture working for us? All I know is snitch culture is is killing our people. Mm. You know, and so I don't live on that that side of the fence. You know, uh, people in my neighborhood know that I'm I'm legit. You know, integrity is an important part of my you know personal co papa. Um, my boys know that, so they know they can't bring that, yeah. you know, that snitches um, vibe to me because I'm like, nah, nah, gee, like the truth will set you free, you know. So what's the truth here? If the truth is not serving your life and not helping you, then this is not the co mm. you know, we're talking about this. Um, and so for those, the, the silent culture, the ignoring culture, how's that serving our mm. people? It's not, because Uncle Bully is still lurking. You know, he's going from one family to the next family. They fulfill that you know that we know is touching our people. Mm. He's yeah. just going to be shipped to another church. Mm. So, you can keep your snitch culture. I'm going to choose to live on the side of the truth. My love, my love, and it's uncomfortable. So yeah, it's good. It's good, good, man. We need to be cool. talking about it. Awesome. awesome. Have you ever had to have um, you know some of these uncomfortable conversations with? Um, perhaps family members that you grew up with or other people who have gone through, perhaps gone through the same experience but interpret the reality differently? Because uh, sometimes I imagine, even in families, one event can happen but everyone perceives it slightly differently yeah. or they interpret it differently. And so sometimes having conversations about what the truth of it is can really bring up you know, hurt feelings sometimes come up with that sort of thing. How's that sort of experience been for yourself? It's it's been exactly that with my family. Um, I love my siblings with all my heart. We love each other. But because we grew up in a real dysfunctional home where we just vomited 
how we felt, you know, if you knew where you stood in my family, if they, if we didn't like you, you heard it, you know, if my brother wanted to punch you in the face, you're going to get their punch, you know, but that was just normal for us. Do I think it's cool? No. Do, am I grateful for that, um, that experience? Yes, I am now because I can have these hard conversations. I'm not scared. You know, I've, I've, I've experienced what it is to speak up and get the fist in the face, you know, because your sibling's uncomfortable. So I've taken that, um, that pain, that mummy, and and use that as um, a courageous gift. Like I can lean in these conversations because what you're going to do to me is nothing compared to what my siblings have done to me. You know, because they dis disagreed with something I said. Um, we sat down and had a talanoa, and I'm the cheesy brother. My brothers call me the cheesy one in my family. Um, when mum was on her, you know, her bed with cancer, I put the invitation out to my siblings. You know. We don't have mum long. Um, how about we come together and have the stala noa and ask mum, you know, every question under the sun. You know, ask her the why this, why that, why you stayed with dad. And, and ask dad as well. Let's have this hard conversation. Of course, my brothers, my re the response was like, hey, no, no, we ain't doing that shit. They're like, you know, but I said, but we need to, you know, let's, let's not leave any stone unturned. You know, let's have this stala noa with mum. And so we did. We had the stala noa with mum. We sat there with mum and dad, and, you know, I told my, I started the conversation, I asked my dad, dad, why were you so mean to my older brothers? Especially one brother in particular, you know, he tortured him, you know, he would torture my older brothers. And um, my dad's response was, what do you mean? I put food on the table, I clothed you, what more did you want? When he responded there, I was like, you know, he had, the, the chaos that he perpetrated in my childhood didn't register mm -hmm. in that moment. I knew then my dad's mental health is not well, mm -hmm. you know. And since then, the research I've done of asking, you know, his sister, my aunties and uncles, you know, I soon learnt that my dad was also t tortured. That his dad, my grandfather, would strip him naked and make it and punish him and do, you know, ridicule and humiliate him. So he was only a product of his environment does that excuse the 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 trauma he you know put us through no but it makes me understand why dad is the way he is so again that was my invitation that is not who i want to be you know i know what unsafety and pain looks like um so it's hard it was hard um you know there was a lot of tears in that room you know before mum passed away but we had those hard conversations. And, and, and my siblings haven't agreed with, you know, with the book coming out. Like, mm -hmm. bro, like, what are you telling our story for? I was like, well, this is actually technically not just your story. This is my story and mum's story. But the only person who I wanted the blessing from was mum. Because this was her story. Me watching her be subjected to violence. And so, again, my mum, proud Samoan lady, private. You know, her response was, son, said, why do you want to tell the sad stories? You know, tell the happy stories too. And I'm like. Which one? <laughs> um, and so mum read our, our api, our puka puka, before she passed away and she gave us her blessing. Mm. She said, son, tell the story well. I really think she liked it because her pay, her photo was on the second page of the book. But <laughs> um, but yeah, she, she, she loved it and gave us her blessing. And so since then, um, me and my siblings, we are in the best place we've ever been, even while mum was alive. We're in the best place we've ever been. We talk about hard things now. We cry together. We spend time together. Um, and it's been beautiful. It's been so beautiful. That's awesome. That I love that for you, because it's... What a journey. What a journey to what hear journey, and man. then being at a place where you guys are now. It's given so much hope, um, not only for your family, but for everyone else that gets to read about it, gets to see the work. Um, and gives hope for those who are going through it now themselves. So, um, man, much love to you, the also. work you do. Also. But I think that's where it stems from when people, you know, question the work or how do you do this work? It starts at home. Like yeah, I've had to do this yeah. with my, the hardest people in my life <laughs> where I first experienced my trauma and having these hard conversations. So because I can do this with my own siblings and family and mum and dad, doing with other people was fine. Like, it's fine <laughs> it's awkward and uncomfortable sometimes but it's fine I know I'll be alright mm. especially doing it with your pops 100% 100% <laughs>
And yeah. so what's that like now? Like I love my dad. I, I go visit him often with, um, you know, he's a better granddad than he ever was a, a father. Um, mm. But I still honour him. He was still my first Superman. Um, and so for me, the forgiveness was, was more for me than him. I had to let go of that. And so, you know, we go over and give him his favourite meai, you know, on, on Sundays. And just watching him interact with, with my kids is beautiful, you know. And so if that's the hope and the gift that he has for the remainder of his life, then sweet you know i get joy that my kids get to experience their granddad um in a different light than what i experienced yeah yeah know? and so that's my way that's, that's my way of honoring him and honoring mom's last wishes so good also sorry one more because i you put up an image today in terms of un, um un, oh, forgiveness and i thought it was such a powerful um, statement and a powerful image and even just thinking about it and I was going oh my gosh are you able to um, explain it so it was an image my daughter Oceana who's 20 years old she's a fine art student she drew so in our app these um, so for 30 days 30 minutes these 30 images which we encourage me to reflect on and so this image particular image I shared today um, had an image of a guy who was pointing the gun through the hole and through that hole his hand came through another hole and the gun was pointing to his back and above this image read the words forgiveness is when i can put the gun down is that what i said yeah yeah forgiveness is when i can put the gun down so he's pointing the gun but the gun is really pointing to his back that was to show that forgiveness actually does more damage unforgiveness does damage to us more than to who we're wanting to point the gun to to forgive us you know it's we're actually pointing the gun at ourselves so once you can put that gun down, forgiveness is when I can put the gun down, you know, we're free. Mm. Yeah, I thought that was powerful. And just the idea of like, when I had to close my eyes and think about the image and the statement and my own unforgiveness, I was going, oh my gosh, I'm pointing it at someone, but with the intent that will do more damage to me than the other person. And, and like just the thought of, like putting it down just gave me this massive release afterwards mm -hmm. so yeah i thought it was powerful and oh, thank you, you know so. i forgive pete now and uh, <laughs> we can continue this work so just a couple of questions to close, um, well, at least for, for, for the questions that I had. One of them was, for someone that is able to talk about most things or almost anything, are there things you don't want to talk about? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And it's still a journey, like, <laughs> but it's, I'm still on my journey, you know. Um, the, the hardest thing I felt at this, this season of my life before the book came out was talking about chapter four. Chapter four, so if you read our book, you know, every every chapter we um, use a topic that society has struggled, um, you know, creating for women. So, you know, she is not your mother. So the book is called She Is Not Your Rehab. So each chapter, will, you know, we had to pinpoint and dismantle what rehab was. So men have often used women as their mothers. You know, they try and find their mum and their partners. So she is not your mother. She is not your father. She is not your um porn star you know the things that we were subject, just subjected to watching porn then we think oh every girl acts like that you know not the truth in reality um the chapter that i struggled the most to to gift um this whenua was she is not your shame so for me shame crippled my my childhood adolescent years um even till most recently um till i met my wife was was crippling shame and so that shame i shared in the book um when wifey came up to me and she goes, do you want to share about it? I was like, share what? So share about this. I was like, fuck off. <laughs> so I am not talking about that. I'm not, I'm not even putting that out there for people to judge and, you know, comment on. Like, that's private. She's like, okay. Six months later, she said, do you want to talk about it? I was like, oh. <laughs> so I had to sit with it for six months. And, um, you know, what I struggled with was body shame. Um, so as a kid, one of the things that my parents thought was, uh, a, a tactic of discipline was to humiliate me so on this chapter four i talk about my shame the shame of being stripped naked and being laughed at for the size of my genitals you know 
to talk about this publicly was freaking like that's your manhood you know how mm. you know what your genitals and how big they are like everything that i grew up around was how big you know you were a man by how big you your penis was so to talk about this you know that my parents would strip me naked and laugh at me because of the size of my penis was freaking shameful that chapter alone has been the most powerful chapter that men from all around the world have written to me to talk about. Like, and these are men I'm like, bro, like, you've, got, you've got a six pack. Like, what are you shameful about? Like, I'll be happy to have your abs. But no, nah, I've struggled with shame too. I've struggled with that. Because the culture that we've normalised, you know, mm. what, what is a masculine man? You know, and so just to talk about that in the chapter, I won't give too much um, so people can assume whatever they want from this podcast and what I share about this. But in context, when you read it, um, I dismantled my shame. And so sharing that has been, um, I would say, the most powerful chapter that people think men don't carry, but we carry a lot of shame. Thank you for asking another hard question. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find the hard being asked hard questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't find it hard like the thing for me when people ask well how do you give so much of yourself I know who's in my corner mm. I know I am loved and that's by my wife that's all I need and I know my children love and adore me that's all I need I don't need people other people's approval or other people's likes or comments I know I'm loved um, that is why I can give so much so people can judge me about you know mock and laugh about that chapter about me sweet as I know I'm loved. Cool as. I loved it. It's so cool. Man, it was. Sorry, we're just, I'm just looking over at Jay's notes. And oh, I know he wants to get get through that. Man, it was. It's um, <laughs> um, well, I know, it was, just. I don't know. It, uh, Matt, it has been. It's been like, such a such a privilege. Very liberating, also. I mm. think you know, not just for myself, but I, yeah, for all the brothers here. So liberating, also it's topics that you know we we kind of like kind of glance like oh yeah we talk about it and kind of kind of just just to touch the surface or scratch the surface but this is deep and even you shooting that last part like, oh my gosh you know super music man, we, don't, we don't talk about that kind of stuff and you're right he's like man I got the book I'm gonna go straight to chapter four <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> but yeah man very very, very privileged you so thank you so much thank you so yeah, much I bro know. I just yeah just um yeah a lot to kind of kind of ponder on and soak in and like man but I got to admit also one thing without without a shadow of a doubt also the work you're doing also please continue doing it. We need more people. We need more men like you who are gonna shine that light. You said shine that light on the shame, um, shine the light on hope, but also, but also shine the light of of life, life giving. You know, there's there's a lot of death. We always hear about a lot of death, 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 and talk mm. speak death over our, our kids and over our. our people but you shine a lot of light and you shine a lot of hope so and a real privilege to sit and have a conversation with the brothers and with you and share and share that light and also to share the hope the hope also man my lord love us we fall so thank you so much from the bottom of my heart also what a what a session thank what you session so also. thank you for having me so, oh, sorry, I think Jay's got some more oh, questions. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I just wanted to give props um, again. Um, I had read that once upon a time you'd wanted to be a teacher. And I think in a lot of ways, just you being on your path, you're kind of doing that yeah. already, like, you know. Um, and so I just wanted to give you props on, on everything you've shared, but just for having the courage to be open. And I mean, look at all the people all the hearts you've touched already and so i just think it's a privilege um just to be able to sit here and, and see some parallels with some of your experience and i think there's a lot of people that come on that have extensive knowledge on different topics but it's really interesting to pick at someone's brain and feel like you're hearing wisdom like this isn't something mm. that's just come from a textbook this is from lived experience it's come from reflection it's come from unpacking from crying from just all sorts dissecting your experience in every way possible so that it makes sense for you and then for you to be able to share it with us i just think man so blessed mm. so just big ups mm. and um, yeah really appreciate your wisdom thank you brother. yeah also i'm just um just encouraged by your your journey um, thank you for being courageous. Thank you for putting it out there for everyone to sort of witness and to model. Um, and 
Thank you for the work that you're doing, especially in the space for our men and our future generation. And for me, the work that I hope to do, um, I'm encouraged. And so I just want to uh, thank you and honor you, give you your flowers now and We'll give you four years because after four years, there's uh, a, another election. <laughs> we'll vote Matt Brown for oh, prime minister. Bro, bro, I'll, I'll the same <laughs> yeah, the same we'll create our own party. Um, <laughs> but um, no, nah, yeah, I just um, something that I needed in terms of um, going to the next step in terms of like some dreams that are being slipped on and, and especially fighting for the voiceless. And so thank you so much also. I just honour you and your wife and your children and the work that you do and um, just know you've got a, a, a team here that will continue to pray for you and um, yeah and just sing your praises so bless you also thank man, you thank you so much also. And, and what Charles was saying um, man because I was saying he was looking at you he said we could be we very well be sitting next to the next Prime Minister of, um, of <laughs> Tero I don't know I don't know I was just thinking of just, just sort of that. <laughs> just the, the way you carry yourself and, and the mana and what, but also the humility and the love for people, man. Also, thank you so much once again. But every guest that comes on, also we always give them a, a gift. We always give them a bit of a caricature of, of what they of how they would look uh, to us. And so this is for you, but also on behalf of the Mandate team. Oh man, thank you, also. <laughs> Oh, super oh, cool. We appreciate it. We appreciate your time, man. We, yeah, we really do. Oh, and thank you so much. Thank you. No, thank you. So thank you so much. Um, Matt, is there, is there anyone, before we, we wrap up, is there anyone that you can think that would be ideal to come on or be perfect to come on on the podcast? Fitz. Fitz. Who's that guy? 275. <laughs> 275. The heart of Mangele. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The male of South Auckland. <laughs> yes. Yes. yes definitely. Cool. Um, yeah, definitely Fitz. Um... Yeah, that's all that's coming to my mind at the moment. So, yeah. uh, also fits and and the beautiful work he's doing, bringing the positive mm. lights into mm. South Auckland. You know, because we've always known the the beautiful things our people are doing in our communities, but to see this also bring these communities and now influence communities outside of Manili mm. is it, it needs to be again told yeah. cool. by our people for our people. I don't love also. We always give the guest uh, the last words also. Any last words of encouragement for the viewers and to the listeners? Also? Yes, my greatest invitation with, with all the work that, you know, people um, that I've worked with, my greatest invitation to everyone is your childhood trauma wasn't your fault, but your healing is your responsibility. Our children deserve the best version of us. Our partners deserve the best of us. So heal so intergenerational trauma stops with us but intergenerational healing can be our legacy so um, love, love thank you once again also what a privilege privilege once again all the best with, with your endeavors and also your trip around the world as well all the best with you and your wife and, and, and the whanau uh, but also once again guys um please like and subscribe and look forward to your wealth with our comments and as usual brothers refine unlock and take, take charge, charge. Red for me! Yeah. <laughs> Mandate.